Uh, as Ariane told uh, uh, us and you uh, that uh, the head of the Canadian Space Agency can unfortunately not join uh, our Congress but also the IAC, uh, I'm happy to announce that we do have a very worthy con uh, substitution or substitute for uh, <coughs> uh, Dr. McLean. Uh, this is uh, Graham uh, Gibbs, uh, who uh, is the former head of uh, international relations uh, in Canadian Space Agency and also the former president uh, of the uh, IEF. Please uh, welcome Dr. Graham Gibbs. Thank you, but I need to do a couple of corrections to the introduction. <laughs> Um, no, I, although I at one time aspired to be the IF, president of the IF, I was not the IF president. Um, also, I was the, the Canadian uh, Space Program's representative in Washington, D.C. for 22 years. Uh, I decided it was finally time to go home and went home last year. Uh, but I will say that I spent the first half of my professional life in the avionics private sector. That's aircraft navigation systems, not the space sector. Um, but the second half in, um, in the space sector. Uh, those of you that know me, well, let me first of all say that Steve, uh, I've had several personal emails from Steve in the last few days. This was really, really last minute. His minister called him for a really important meeting to prepare for a cabinet meeting on some issues near and dear to our heart and the agency. Um, I know that he is really, really disappointed at not being here today and for the rest of the week, but particularly today, Steve Gibbs, as you can imagine, ex astronaut head of the agency, gives lots and lots of speeches, but he particularly enjoys talking to a crowd like this, young professionals. Um, so I know he's really disappointed. Um, I know he would also looked out in this room and thought to himself, our future is in very good hands. Um, I would say that uh, having only a year ago uh, returned back to Canada from Washington, uh, been involved in the international community for all the 22 years that I've been in the space sector. Uh, you're probably looking at the current situation in most of the major space nations as pretty traumatic, as, as all of our governments deal with um, the economic situation. Uh, it's not a pretty picture in most sectors, including the space sector. Have faith. Uh, those of us with these gray beards uh, have been here before. This too will change. Um, and I think we're absolutely convinced that you have a very, very bright future in the space sector. So don't, please do not be discouraged um, with what's going on at the moment. It will change, it will improve, and you'll have a very bright future. Uh, those of you that know me know that I don't give, I don't read speeches ordinarily. Uh, but unfortunately on this occasion I have to because it was such last minute that I didn't have time to prepare my own speech. Uh, so I am going to have to give Steve's speech for him. Um, also, those of you that know me, that having spent 22 years in Washington, I've been very much influenced by NASA, so I usually don't even give speeches without charts. I don't have charts either. <laughs> <laughs> so today, going to the script, I want to talk about Canada's role in space, um, specifically how we became a space faring nation, what space has meant for our country, and where I expect to take us in the future. Um, there is a quote from Prime Minister Mackenzie Quinn King in the 40s, I forget the exact date, that I've often used in speeches, and it's actually not here. Uh, anyway, previous Canadian Prime Minister said, if some countries have too much history, Canada has too much geography. Um, <laughs> I usually add, and probably too much of the wrong atmosphere, when you think about the iron strike disturbances and, and what affects our communication systems. It is that, it is the size of our country that got us and the nature of our country that got us into the space sector. Um, we're a big country. Uh, we're, um, in terms of landmass, uh, only Russia is larger. Our country is also bordered by three oceans. Uh, most countries' phrases say coast to coast. In Canada, you will hear the phrase coast to coast to coast, uh, <laughs> because we have to remember the Arctic Ocean. Um, our population, however, despite the size of our country, is pretty small, uh, 25, 28 million or thereabouts, um, uh, and very diverse. Okay, 90% of the population live within 40 miles of the, of the U.S. border, 
uh, but we have a lot of communities uh, that are much, much farther away. Um, vast areas of the country may remain relatively undeveloped, hard to reach, and often sparsely populated, and our climate, to put it mildly, can be challenging. Um, for these reasons alone, we require space technology to observe, monitor, and communicate effectively from coast to coast to coast, uh, and with the world. But Canada needs space for other reasons. We have an advanced and growing economy, like most other developed countries. We now rely on space to carry out ever-expanding range of public policy objectives, such as advancing our territorial sovereignty, supporting the Canadian Forces operations, monitoring the environment, promoting safety and security, and defining our role in the world. <coughs> Despite our size, we are a small country when it comes to, in terms of the economy and population. And as a result, we don't spend very much money in our space sector. In fact, it's about 300 million a year, uh, the lowest uh, in the G8. And I think we're about 14th uh, in the world in terms of um, what we spend on space relative to our GDP. <laughs> Um, although I continue to be extremely amazed and proud and gave lots of presentations in Washington at, at, at what we're able to do with that 300 million. We are, and I'm digressing now, but we have, uh, we have made serious contributions to all the major spacefaring disciplines, uh, which I think is a huge source of pride to Canada, not understood most by a lot of Canadians who just see the iconic Canada arm, which is. Uh, uh, obviously iconic and a great achievement. We do so much else as well. Back to the speech. Um, when we launched the Alouette satellite in 1962, we became the third nation in space after uh, the Soviet Union, as, uh, as, as it was then, and the US. We were also one of the first countries to use satellite imagery to map our territory and to access our resources. We built the world's first domestic satellite telecommunications system effectively linking Canadians from coast to coast and nearly to the third coast. Uh, we had direct-to-home TV coverage uh, very early on. We developed and built sensitive space instruments and satellites to monitor the atmospheric pollution and assess the health of our ozone layer. Um, since the very beginning, uh, we've had technical and scientific expertise, and I'm digressing in the speech, um, uh, with particular interest in the upper atmosphere, the ionosphere in particular, because that uh, has tremendous effects on our um, uh, communication systems, even when there were HF around us bouncing off the ionosphere. Um, we have considerable interest in the ozone layer, as actually comes up in the speech, uh, and so on, because of the location of our country and the size of our country. We developed and continue to develop world-leading technologies in ground reception systems for satellite navigation as augmentation of GPS systems. As a partner, we have been part of the International Space Station since its inception, and I can attest to that, having been through about 99 different redesigns of the space station, but in any event, it is finished, it is complete, and it's a, an incredible achievement. Uh, our work on this project uh, was the development of Canadarm2, the large manipulator, following up from the manipulator we had on the, uh, on the space shuttle, and a two-armed robot that we call Dexter, um, a testament to Canadian engineering skill and excellence and a worldwide symbol of our expertise in space. While we do not have uh, launch facilities or rockets ourselves, except sounding rockets, um, we don't like to brag about this too much because uh, we've got great partners in the state. But in fact, our astronauts, uh, Canadian, there have been more Canadian astronauts than, than any other country flown in space other than the United States and Russia. Um, but now we have to think about the European Space Agency Astronaut Corps, which used to be national astronauts now, so ESA actually has collectively more astronauts, it's have had more launches than we have, but anyway. Um, we've done pretty well, um, uh, and we thank our partners at NASA particularly for that. So how do we do all this? Um, we, how do we become a space nation? The common thread that emerges in the examples I've just cited is that we did not do it alone. Rather, we collaborated, leveraged the relationship, worked with others, we sought out and joined, formed partnerships, and entered into mutually beneficial agreements. For nearly five decades that we've been in space, Canada's worked hand in hand with other countries and other space carrying nations. We partnered with Canada's space industry, with Canada's educational organizations, institutions, and more and more with other government departments in, in Canada and, and agencies. Um, 
Another speech that I've often given when I was in Washington is, uh, we have developed an incredible niche technology or a niche um, method of collaboration. It's, it's amazed, it continues to amaze me how we're able to, to match um, our scientific interest with a related technical uh, or technology so that when we partner with other countries, um, it's not, we're not, we're adding real value to their missions uh, with a related technology specific to that mission, but it's uh, the science coming out of that mission is, is what we have a particular interest in as well. Uh, there are more than 200 organizations in Canada are actively involved in space science, engineering, and technology. So there's lots of opportunities for the Canadian, Canadians here in the audience. Um, spread across the country, these organizations employ more than 7,500 people of which over 3,700 are classified as highly qualified professionals. And together they generate some something over $3 billion worth of revenue a year, which is a pretty high number for by Canadian standards. Uh, their combined efforts not only provide our country with an indigenous space capability, they give us jurisdiction and control over technologies that are vital to Canada's public policy objectives. But the playing field is shifting, so I'm looking at the future of it. Technological, economic, and societal changes are dramatically and profoundly altering Canada and the rest of the world. More and more countries and organizations are looking at space to meet their national needs. The playing field is also expanding, as we have seen just very recently with the creation of the uh, South African National Space Agency uh, and plaudits to, to South Africa for that. Um, over the next one or two decades, an ever increasing number of countries will launch hundreds of satellites. As they do, the availability of space data will increase dramatically. So will the demand for this data and the areas in which such data are used and applied. The challenge for Canada, actually for most Australian <coughs> nations, is how best to respond to this rapidly expanding interest in space. What can we do to maintain our present position? That is a question we ask ourselves in Canada. And uh, in the same token, and assume an even larger role in this unparalleled growth in space research and exploration. So now it's getting a bit parochial with the speech. Uh, one thing is certain do nothing, and we will be trampled in the stampede. That's why we've acted boldly, decisively, and innovatively. Through consultation and collaboration, we're refocusing our efforts in the very direction of our space programs and activities to catapult Canada into a new, even more successful era in space. Our future goals for space knowledge. My future goals for space knowledge is simple but powerful truth. The many uses of space and space-based technology by government and industry improve the lives of all Canadians in countless ways. This is a message that we as an agency have to continuously sell uh, in my new job now in Ottawa. Space has become and will remain an undeniable force for good in our daily lives. The success of this new direction will depend on the continued participation of those who have made us so successful in the past. Government, industry, and academia all work together. Their input was vital in the development of a comprehensive and integrated strategy and will be just as vital in ensuring that together we achieve our goals. The role of government is also complex. At any given time, a government department can be a user, an enabler, policymaker, or regulator in relation to our space industry and I would add into our space sector overall. Um, while overall coordination rests with the Canadian Space Agency and the Space Program in Canada, these government departments will use their space experience and the tools available to them to help us produce long-term roadmaps for space technology developments and applications over there. A strong and innovative space industry is obviously critical for the, for the secure and sustained use of space by Canada. Canada's space program owes much of its success to close government industry collaboration. Building on that synergy will be a center for its future, and that is why I'm optimistic about the ongoing strategic review of the aerospace and space sector. This was a review that was um, announced by our government in the last budget, uh, an 18-month uh, strategic review of the entire aerospace and space sector. It was uh, pleasing to us that, I mean, we often, aerospace is aero and space, but in, in this particular announcement, they singled out space. Um, uh, which we personally were pretty, pretty happy with because sometimes people just think of aerospace as being the aero guys. Um, <coughs> the spotlight, however, will shine most brightly on Canada's academic sector because it's the primary training ground for, training ground for future generations of space scientists, engineers, and explorers. 
Canada's academic institutions supported by industry and the CSA are largely responsible for Canada's well-earned and widespread reputation for excellence in space science and technology. And if anyone wants to ask me any questions, I've got lots of examples in my head about that. Um, working in tandem with Canada's space industry, our universities are the engine that powers Canada's activities in space research and exploration. We, are, we at the CSA are the fuel, the catalyst, if you will, to keep that engine running at peak efficiency. And in fact, a recent reorganization of the space agency uh, has been directed specifically at a directorate aimed uh, primarily at achieving that goal. Certainly, Canada's academic space, academic sector has performed flawlessly over the past 50 years. We have successfully developed a critical mass of intellectual capital, research infrastructure, and qualified people we need to use space effectively and for the public good. And again, I have been amazed over the years that I've been involved in the program at the, uh, the level of expertise uh, in our scientific community at our, at our institutions uh, throughout Canada, universities throughout Canada, uh, whether it's earth and atmospheric science or astronomy uh, and, and other fields like that, uh, world-class expertise, um, which is a huge source of pride. If we want to keep that reputation, Canada's universities must continue to attract and retain the best and brightest minds in the area of space research. But the competition for such talent is increasingly fierce, not only among countries, but also across research disciplines. To that end, we're working with universities to find out what can be done to encourage talented young people to choose careers in space research. We're, we recognize that while taking leading edge infrastructures, and, uh, we recognize that it will take leading edge infrastructures and sustained funding will require more space missions so young researchers and scientists can hone their skills and generate research results at a faster pace. And this is one of the goals of our reorganized directorate, um, which is titled the Science and Technology Directorate of the CSA, but is actually about capacity building. They are really focusing, and those of you that know David Kendall, he's the director of that directorate, he's also on the AI Bureau. Um, they're putting plans in place for more and more frequent opportunities for young researchers, uh, high altitude balloons, nanosats, um, things that, you know, uh, missions that can take place within a PhD period, but that, that'd be pretty novel for a lot of people. Um, so that's a real focus uh, at the agency. Um, it will take greater access to the global pool of advanced knowledge, ideas, and data, and it will take more participation in international space research programs and activities. Working with academia and industry, we believe we can deliver on these requirements. We believe we can do what it takes to give committed researchers an opportunity to pursue their interest in space, particularly in those areas that address Canadian priorities. The Government of Canada's willingness to work closely with other space agencies is critical to our efforts. We know that Budding researchers will gain access to data from existing space assets and to the vast archive of data collected in previous space missions only through collaboration with other countries and agencies. And let me just add that a, a hallmark of our, of our partnership and our goals in partnership with other countries has always been to add real value, uh, to not be um, a tag along and, and take and not give. Um, we really strive to make sure that we make a real valued and welcomed contribution to our, to our partners' missions, which I think is why we have become uh, a valued partner by, by many uh, around the world. As important as academia is to our future in space, we cannot ignore the contribution of Canada's space industry. I am confident our space industry will respond to the emerging challenge by leveraging its innovation capability, particularly in areas such as financing, project management, and promoting partnerships and synergies. Certainly at the Canadian Space Agency, we're doing all we can to promote even closer and stronger links between universities and industry. The last page. <laughs> Fortunately, many of the bright minds that will need to continue our success in space are already hard at work in universities across Canada. In 2009, we held uh, Canada's third national astronaut recruitment campaign. Uh, amazingly, we got some 12,000 applicants from a very small country, that's not bad. Um, and we think better yet, of those 12,000, some 5,300 possess the basic requirements to pass the first level of, of screening. Um, so out of those 5,300, the very best, two of them, uh, became Canada's two new astronauts. And in fact, just last month, Jeremy, Han Jeremy Hansen and David Saint-Jacques completed their uh, basic astronaut training at the uh, NASA Johnson Space Flight Center. 
One of them may very likely become part of an international team that will live and work on the moon, or perhaps serve a, on an international mission to retrieve rock and soil samples from an asteroid or Mars. Other applicants, I'm sure, will unravel the mysteries and wonder of space in their own way. Some will study climate change or perhaps monitor our environment. Others may choose to map the Canadian landmass or help manage our natural resources. Many will dedicate themselves to pushing the envelope in areas of medical research and treatment. One thing is for sure, each will play a part and each will help Canada take full advantage of the rapid growth of space research and exploration around the world. I'm convinced that we're on the right path and I'm confident that we're doing what it takes to strengthen Canada's position as an innovative space-faring nation. And let me just add, before we clap, um, that with all the focus on human spaceflight, I'm involved in the, in the ISEG activity that, uh, that Bert described uh, very eloquently. Um, and so actually, let me just add another thing about international cooperation. Uh, you have to be a morning person. Uh, I've been involved in ISEG now for since its inception and the creation of the exploration strategy. Uh, be prepared for 6 a.m. telecoms if you live on the east coast of North America. It's okay for the French, except it interferes with their lunch. It's bad for the Japanese, it's about 8 p.m. at night, but um, if you're on the east coast of North America, be prepared for early mornings. I have at least one telecom a week uh, that begins at about 6 a.m. Uh, and others, of course, the same. The same. Um, also, there's a lot of focus on what's next for human spaceflight. Don't ignore all the other disciplines. There's a lot of really interesting things going on. Um, they may not always hit the headlines, uh, which is sad in some respects, but you're looking at Earth and atmospheric science projects, uh, planetary robotic exploration, uh, good progress is being made. Uh, finally, on what I consider to be the holy grail of, of planetary exploration, that is a Mars sample return mission. A lot of interest there. Uh, great news uh, with the uh, the collaboration now with ESA and NASA on the Mars sample on uh, the next missions of, of Mars. Um, astronomy missions, not just the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, there are small telescopes. Uh, there's lots going on in astronomy. Um, so uh, medical research, we're going to need medical autonomy. We're going to need to know how to do telemedicine uh, when we look at long duration human space flight. Radiation protection, understanding radiation. There's a lot of disciplines out there. Space weather, let me not forget space weather um, as another discipline. So uh, when you're looking at your careers, um, look at the big picture uh, and uh, you'll have fun just as, just as we had and we all at once continue to have fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>